Good afternoon, St. Paul Public School staff. Superintendent Joe Gothard here to spend some time with you this afternoon to take you a little bit uh, to the past of where we've been, to talk about where we are, and to talk about how and when we could possibly move forward. Uh, first, I want to thank all of you. Um, what you accomplished uh, for in March with our uh, closures, going into the summer with lots and lots of questions, getting some of those answered now, and continuing to face uncertain times as we move forward. I just really appreciate your patience, uh, the thoughtfulness that, that you've given, uh, the love and compassion that you've provided this community, our students, uh, your colleagues, and, and this community as a whole. I really do appreciate um, everything that you've given. I um, want to start with, in, back in June, we were given guidance from the Minnesota Department of Education. And that guidance was no real surprise that we were to create different contingency models for the opening of this school year. Uh, the first was to come back to full in-person learning or traditional schooling as we knew it uh, prior to March. Uh, the second was to create a hybrid schedule where we would have only some of our students in, 50% uh, of our students in at a time, and rely on distance learning for the rest of that time. And the third, of course, is full distance learning. Uh, so we uh, had anticipated that. We had begun uh, planning far before June uh, for those three different scenarios and really spent uh, time this summer uh, collaborating, uh, gathering additional information from our community, uh, making sure that we heard from you, make sure we heard from students and families uh, to try to better understand how we could meet the needs in all three of those scenarios. Um, given other factors that would help us make our ultimate decision. As you know, the governor held a press conference along with Minnesota Department of Education Commissioner Mary Catherine Ricker, uh, Minnesota Department of Health Commissioner Jan Malcolm um, uh, last week, and they provided final guidance and recommendations uh, based on that, uh, that plan that was given to us or the direction that was given to us in June. I can't tell you how much I appreciate them as someone who has spent the better part of the last five months following um, COVID-19 and schools and uh, the politics of it all around the country, uh, really do appreciate the leadership that we've gotten from the, uh, the governor and the, and the commissioners that, that I mentioned. Um, they have been collaborative with us. Uh, they have relied on our expertise and gotten feedback from our communities in, in generating what I believe is a, is a really good plan for us to use as we consider how we're going to reopen in the 2021 uh, school year. As you know, uh, following the, uh, that plan coming out, uh, there was data, specific data, that was generated from Ramsey County and COVID cases over a 14-day uh, cumulative case rate. Uh, and that data uh, then is tied to five different recommendations for the restrictions on the models that we are able to open under uh, this coming September. And for us, it was uh, important data for us to consider, uh, but I have to tell you that there are many other things that we had to consider as a school community and I had to consider as a leader when the health and safety of our, our staff and our students and our community as a whole is uh, incredibly important to me. Um, so I, I, I wanna let you know that uh, that I did not make that recommendation, uh, take that recommendation lightly at all in terms of using that data, but not having that be the only thing that we considered uh, when making our decision. And I in no way fault the governor or our commissioners. And in fact, I continually applaud them and, and uh, continue to be an equal partner with them in wanting to get our school safely reopened. So I did uh, bring a recommendation to the Board of Education that we begin our school year in 100% distance learning 2.0 with support and with a commitment that we look and analyze how and when we successfully transition into our future. And it's important to, to point those words out. You know, we in June created contingent plans, plans that were set in stone for if we're given the ability, here's how we would do it. Well, now we have those three plans in hand. Uh, they're not perfect, we're still working on them. Uh, but we are ready to begin assessing how can we transition uh, from distance learning into hybrid, into in-person in some way, shape, or form. Distance Learning 2.0 is our start. It's the place that we are starting at this year until we believe those other factors uh, can be uh, clearly um, answered and, and considered and, and part of how we're going to safely uh, transition into, into less restrictive models. So I wanted to share with you the stages of return for in-person learning that we presented to the Board of Education last night. On there, there are five different colors on our dial, again, starting in distance learning, 
2.0. Uh, dial number three, if you will, is hybrid learning, and five is in-person learning. We intentionally left stages two and four open. There's a color there, and there's room for the dial to be there. But in terms of the descriptive analysis of what would take place in those two, we left open. And we did that for a very important reason. I did not want to at all uh, promise to you, promise to our community, that on a certain day we're bringing all K through five back. I want us to continue to have flexibility in how we eventually bring back students, bring back staff, and bring back um, our community in a, in a hybrid, in-person uh, type model. Uh, so I wanted to be sure that we could have flexibility to do that. So what's an example? Well, we might decide that all pre-K K come back, um, and that would be our first group to hybrid. And of course, these are all subject to, to making sure that we can agree on that and we do this work together. But I just wanted to explain for you why you might see some other models uh, from other districts, and they might have it explicitly laid out. Uh, and I just did not feel like I wanted to um, uh, back us into that corner right now and, and be that explicit. So we can continue to fill that in as we go, but I wanted to give you just a general explanation of the stages to return in person. You might say, when will we know that we're going to consider those, those other models? So there's a few things I want to talk with you about today in regard to that. The first is that uh, last night at our board meeting and in, in passing that resolution, we also shared two dates with you. We shared September 25th and October 14th. Now the importance of those two dates are they come with some natural breaks in our calendar. Uh, the first is September 25th would give us some lead up time uh, for us to make a transition at, at following MEA break. Um, and so it's, it's important for us to make sure that any decision that we make, uh, not only have we carefully thought about uh, arriving at that decision, but we've also given ample lead up time following the decision to effectively make the transition. And obviously safety is the number one thing here and there's many, uh, many factors for us to consider um, our safe reopening and transition, if you will, from our starting point. The second date is October 14th. Uh, so that would give us that chance to transition to start quarter two. Uh, so again, following MEA break and following quarter two right now are two days that at least we've shared publicly that we will look to see if we can assess our readiness and our ability to safely and effectively transition into hybrid learning. That would be the first, uh, the first uh, change in our, in our stages of return. So I wanted to, to share a little bit more with you about that. <clears throat> and then also talk about some of the readiness checklists when we consider what do we need to transition into a hybrid model. The first thing is obviously our community virus spread. Now, you know, when we look at getting a number uh, from Ramsey County and, and continuing to monitor that, and, and I should say that that number was released about a, a few hours ago actually today, and, and it has gone up. Um, I think we were at 16.99 uh, uh, last week, and today we're at 19.65. So it is moving in a trend that none of us want to see. There's, there's no doubt about that. Uh, but I also want to share with you that when we look at data for Ramsey County, when we look at data for St. Paul, when we look at data by zip code, and we look at data for how COVID-19 has impacted our non-white community members, there are disproportionate numbers uh, that really jump out at me. And it says to me that not all of St. Paul looks like the state of Minnesota. And that is incredibly important to me as obviously we've lost someone dear to us uh, from our community from this disease. And the individuals I've talked to who I've known who've, who have um, gotten COVID-19 and have been recovering, um, you know, represent those very communities. Uh, so there's some things that are connecting for me that make me believe that we have some considerations that we have to be especially aware of in St. Paul as, as it relates to St. Paul Public Schools, our staff, our students, and our families. So I wanted to share that with you, that community virus spread is more than just the aggregate numbers uh, that we get for the county or the state, that we have to look at how does this impact our community, our people. The second thing is distance learning 2.0 and making sure that we've been able to successfully launch that. The success of a hybrid is going to rely on distance learning as a, as a you know, pretty big portion of it still, more than 50%. Um, our site logistics, um, as you know, many of you have been in the district far longer than me. Uh, none of our 60 plus buildings look the same. Their layouts are different. Uh, the number of students that they have, whether they're old or new, uh, have wide or narrow hallways. And you know, there's just many considerations that our facilities team, our operations team have been uh, looking at and considering and working with buildings 
to make sure that uh, for our eventual return, we've really been thoughtful about what that would look like and, and how we can educate everyone. Enrollment uh, for uh, SPPS virtual learning and just enrollment in general. You know, for us to make a plan right now for hybrid when I can't tell you I know how many students will be here on September 8th and, and really for the next couple weeks after that, um, I think it would be doing all of us a disservice. Um, I think for any volatility around a precise plan for safety, uh, we have to eliminate. And, and I believe that it's going to take us a few weeks to maybe not settle in, but at least get some numbers that we can feel confident about in, in how we're going to plan for those transitions. Uh, so I do think that this is a year like no other, and there may be some trends that look similar, but when you have to factor in the different safety aspects and you have to factor in some of the guidelines that we've been given, uh, this is a start like no other, and I want to make sure that we're giving the right time to do that. Um, the staffing obviously would be the next piece from enrollment to make sure that we're sufficiently staffed to meet those safety guidelines and, and make sure that we're doing that and ready to do that with our transition as well. Um, our school schedules are going to change, as you know. When we, if we move into a hybrid schedule, obviously our students will be there for a couple of days a week and be in distance learning for three. And I want you to consider this. For transportation purposes, we have uh, relied on our uh, school buses and transportation to load materials and meals all over this community and it's been fantastic. In fact, six million meals have been delivered uh, out to the St. Paul community, something that we should all be incredibly proud of. When we move students from uh, distance learning to hybrid, now we are using our buses to continue to deliver meals, but we're also using them to deliver students for arrival and departure. Um, so there's some uh, logistics, many would say complications. There are some things for us, some barriers to remove to overcome uh, for us to do that well and make sure that, again, we're adhering to safety. Uh, there's, there's no room for errors and there's no room for uh, not being ready when it comes to the importance of safety, especially with COVID-19. It's hard enough in a regular, what I'll call normal year. Um, if anything, it's, it's obviously much, much more now. So we have to keep that in mind. And then finally, sufficient communication time. Uh, I don't want to send out a robocall on a Friday saying you're starting in hybrid on Monday. You don't want to hear that as a staff, and I know our families uh, don't want to hear that as well. So we want to make sound decisions at the right time, and we want to build in what we're calling lead-up time. So we make sure that once a decision is made that we've given proper time for us to do this effectively and do it safely and do it together. Uh, so those things are really important to us. The hybrid checklist or the transition checklist uh, that's just one set of it. Um, last night, if you listened in on our board meeting, uh, you know that some of the questions we've been fielding have been, what specific data are you looking at to make the decisions? I think that's a, a really important question, and it's a, it's a question that, uh, that we have to consider with all the information we're gathering and making these decisions. So I'll say this to you. We are going to create a framework so that the community and you all understand uh, what some of the things we're looking for in these stage transitions. What are some explicit narratives that explain how we're looking at it and what we're looking at? And then what data will support that? So it's, it's two stories, two different stories. One more qualitative, you know, what are we looking at? How are we doing the work? And the other is what are we relying on? What numbers are we relying on? I've shared with you the uh, cumulative case rate for the previous 14 days. There are other data that we have to look at as well. Uh, one example, is if we would eventually move into, as the state is defined, K through five or pre-K through five uh, in-person learning, uh, the number of staff who we would have to hire to do that is, is astronomical uh, for us. It's a, it's a big number, perhaps in the thousands. So we've got to make sure that we think about that. When we reduce how many students we can have on any one site, we may not have room in those sites, so we would have to spread students out throughout the city, uh, through other sites, and of course, to meet those ratios, we would need the adequate staff, uh, staff to do that as well. So those are decisions that we really have to think about carefully. And as I alluded to earlier, instead of pre-K-5 all at once, it may make sense for us to stage this in different ways that are more incremental, uh, that uh, we have the ability to not only do well, but we can control a little bit more too. So I just wanted to give you a little bit of a, uh, a line into that and what you might expect in terms of a readiness framework that you heard us talk about last night and that we've had some discussions about already today. And we'll continue to, to work on um, getting more information out to you. <clears throat> so again, just to recap before I move into a few of the questions that I've received or that have come my way, 
Um, I want to share with you again around the importance of September 25th and October 14th. Those are just two days right now that we've selected as kind of the latest we would want to know, we would want to let you know, let our community know, that we are uh, ready for a transition on either the Monday following MEA break or to start the second quarter. Um, so those are um, important dates for that purpose, and we will be sure that we're sharing information with you as, as we go along. Now, many of you have shared uh, questions, observations, uh, thoughts, uh, and it's, it's been incredibly helpful. I, I appreciate it very much. I engage on Twitter as much as I can, but I have to be honest with you, that's a, a whole nother full-time job if you really want to do it and do it well, but it has been helpful, and it's been great for me to not only hear your perspectives, but to really hear perspectives from all around the country as it relates to what this reopening means. And it could be students, uh, families, parents, caregivers, uh, teachers, principals, superintendents. Um, I participate in, in many different uh, superintendent leadership groups from here in the metro and also with our Council of Great City Schools counterparts throughout the country. And uh, today's, I, I will share with you, it was, it was, um, it was a hard call. Um, I'm looking at my uh, colleagues from around the country in some of the largest districts who um, are facing uh, challenges like ours and many, many times greater uh, due to the sheer size, perhaps due to the politics, perhaps, dear to, uh, uh, perhaps because of how they're led um, in their state in terms of their, their um, political leaders. Um, so I just want to mention that to you that uh, none of us are alone in this. Each of us are, are facing this in our uh, public pre-K 12 districts in, in many different ways and um, I'm really proud of <clears throat> you and all of us in, in terms of how we've handled this and uh, the great leadership and support that we've gotten. So one of the questions is hybrid schedules, just many questions about how will we do this. You're right, it's, it's anything but normal for those of you who have been in schools um, as long as I have and, and many longer uh, in, in terms of this being you know, the new schedule. So I do want to share that we've received uh, letters from both uh, SPFE and Teamsters Local 320 for us to look at the MOUs that were um, agreed upon in the spring to make sure that we can address any concerns as it relates to distance learning 2.0, hybrid and in person. Now, I, obviously our focus right now has to be on distance learning. That's how we're beginning on September 8th. But I want to share a commitment that I have and I hope that everybody in our organization has to already be thinking about what can we begin to work on now so when and if the time comes that we're ready to make that transition that we've already worked on some of the agreements that we would need that are necessary uh, for us to together um, come back in, in that transition plan way. So I just wanted to, to share that with you. It's really important to me that, that right now we're working for where we want to be and, and we'll continue to do so. Will teachers be allowed in their school buildings when are we, when we are in distance learning? It would be helpful for teachers to have the option to plan, record, or provide live lessons from their classrooms that is full of school materials. Uh, I can agree with you in that way. I've, I said, I believe in an interview recently that uh, to be told you're shutting down and packing up my biology curriculum in a milk crate uh, to teach biology out of my living room, I can't imagine how difficult that would be. I, I've thought about it many times. I'm sure I would have made it work, uh, but I know in my lab I could have made it better. Um, what I'll share with you about that is that we're aware of that, uh, that you're eager to get back to offices or classrooms. Um, staff representing facilities, health and wellness and security, emergency management are working to provide a process and procedure for staff to safely access district buildings in preparation for the launch of Distance Learning 2.0. A communication including a specific process and procedure will come out shortly. We'll prioritize student and staff safety and also provide a tool to request an assigned window of time uh, for staff to do this. You know, part of what we're trying to do here is, is get our buildings as clean as they've ever been and keep them that way. So this isn't something where we just want to open the doors because, you know, we believe it's the, um, you know, we're able to do it. We want to make sure that we can do it in conjunction with the plans that we have to keep our buildings as safe, orderly, and, um, and healthy as possible as well. So we do want to somewhat regulate it and we'll be communicating with you how we can do that in the future. And if it isn't working, we have to work together to find a way that will make it work. That, that's, that's my commitment. Will the school calendar look the same as planned, uh, teacher development days, et cetera? You know, we'll continue to address the, the needs of the calendar, and I'm going to strive for everyone in our organization to provide, uh, prioritize, excuse me, balance. Um, and I need to hear this sometimes too. Um, I'm reminded by my team and others um, all the time when 
Um, you know, sometimes we get so focused on our work, sometimes we get so focused on the task at hand, we lose perspective of how it impacts others. Uh, so I'm really going to work with all of you, all of us, uh, to prioritize balance as we move through the school year. We should not be afraid at all uh, to make courageous adjustments if we feel uh, they're needed, uh, but communication is key to that, as you know as well. Decisions we make in a district our size has ripple effects uh, that, that generate out into the community. We want to make sure that we're thinking about. <clears throat> Many parents are discussing, this is an equity question, discussing hosting pods of students at their homes to help with distance learning. How can we make sure this is equitable? I, I've heard about some of this. It's kind of a viral thing where people around the country are sharing this. And, and I, th I think for us in the spring, I recognized that um, our students and families needed help for distance learning. Uh, the term distance learning support was born in the spring, and, and I said to our team, we've got to find a way to support distance learning in the fall if that is our eventual model. So we are ready to stand up some very um, specific support for our students and families around how can we help families understand and, and partner with learning, how can we make sure the technology is easy and, and uh, there's the ability to access it, and how can we even do some limited in-person tutoring and support for our students. Um, how can we reassign staff, work with our volunteers, our uh, nonprofit organizations, and our, our ready partners in the community to do this? And I'm excited that, uh, uh, that we have a team that's working to, to mobilize this and to make sure that through a referral process, that if you're a teacher and you see a student is struggling, you're a parent and you're struggling, or your student is struggling, or you're a student and you're struggling, that there's a way for you to say, I need help, and us to differentiate and individualize that support and find a way to do it. Um, so we'll be uh, sharing more information about distance learning support. That's one way that I can share with you that um, I've kind of thought about it uh, in terms of a family pod or a neighborhood pod. It's an SPPS community pod. How are we going to wrap our arms around our students and our families and, and give them the help and support that they need? Will distance learning be asynchronous again this fall to allow flexibility for families? How do we decide who gets to decide what days of the week students are in the classroom? Again, this is speculating a little bit with a hybrid. Uh, schedule. We've got things to work out there. I'm not going to answer that today. What I will share with you is that one of the most consistent feedbacks I heard was the uh, desire for more face-to-face -face time uh, or synchronous same-time learning, um, whether it be social-emotional connections or, or actual lesson planning or lesson delivery, um, something that I, I think our, our families and many of our families and students really want and desire. And, and I'll share this with you. I'm not looking and asking you to say, you know what, I want 90-minute 90 less, 90 lessons on video or planned or, or live streamed. But I do think that even some small times where we can get together, but they're consistent and more frequent, I, I think would go a long way with our community. Uh, so let's find a way to do that. Let's find a way to build on that. Let's find a way to build with what some successful practices have been in SPPS and around. And let's support one another in doing that because that's what our families and our kids want. And I'd really like to work with you and partner with you to make sure that we're doing that. <clears throat> I've got a long response here, so I will not read this whole thing to you. But the question is, positive cases, what happens? What happens if one kid gets sick? Does the whole class quarantine? Or do we switch, switch to DL, the whole grade, the school? And sadly, you all, this is uh, happening right now. You know, With our late start date, we get to see uh, dress rehearsal around the country as schools are opening. And I was... Um, caused me to pause many times seeing a picture that went viral this week of a hallway in another state of a school that doesn't have a state that doesn't have a state uh, mask mandate a school district that's not using a mask mandate it's optional um, and to see students shoulder to shoulder uh, in a hallway just should not be happening uh, there is nothing nothing that I've read or seen that would cause me to think that that would be a, a good idea even in the best of conditions that we have right now with all the other safety things um, that we're looking at, especially without cloth masks at the very, very least in terms of that disturbing picture. And in that same state, they've had outbreaks. They've had individual students in a district um, a test positive. They, staff, you know, of a large district also in a southern state, uh, you know, that have had either positive tests themselves or been directly exposed to someone, contacted someone who... Um, who had it. So we're, again, seeing how districts are, are handling this or ready for this or not. Um, from us, we absolutely, and we'll be sharing this, and this is already in writing, but Mary Langworthy, who is our supervisor of health services, uh, is in ready command with all of our, our district health support staff, our operations team, 
Um, it has been uh, just really uh, impressive to watch them work, to educate themselves about this, to partner with uh, St. Paul Ramsey County uh, and the State Health Department. Um, and I was on a call this week with them as well to, to verify um, how much they've relied and appreciated the support of their local uh, school nurses and health supervisors. Um, so just very proud of the work that they've done. So we have a protocol that we've already had to use um, in, in terms of if we have a positive case in any of our sites uh, that would obviously apply to any of our sites that are up and running now, Discovery Club, some of our um, nutrition services sites, um, just, uh, uh, essential kit care, excuse me. Um, so that will also apply to if and when we transition into in-person learning, any in-person contact that we have, we would follow this protocol. Uh, so we'll be sharing that with you in writing to make sure that you understand it. We'll be sharing it with our leaders, our supervisors, so you have a, a single point contact for you at your school, your work location, someone who you can rely on who either has information or knows that direct line to someone who does. And I'd love to be there for each and every one of you individually if you have information, because I definitely know who that is. But the more people we can position to have this information readily available uh, so that you can have confidence and comfort in knowing that your questions can be answered and we can get that information out quickly, it's, it's going to help all of us as well. And obviously, I want to avoid um, you know, being you know, the district that has to face outbreaks. I don't want anyone to have to deal with this. Uh, the reality is, you all, until there's, a, until there's a vaccine and until there's national leadership that truly makes this a priority, you know, not just some kind of game, but a real priority that is life and death, that is a health situation, um, I can't confidently say, uh, you know, that we're going to be able to turn the corner on this. And it's, it's despicable and it's, it's truly sad that I've had to become a health expert and not someone who wants to champion the opening of our school year. And I'm uh, beyond disappointed, uh, but I'm grateful for you because I know that you will make the best of all this, uh, that we will work together, that there will be a day when we move beyond this. I wish I could tell you when it will be, but that day will come. Uh, but for right now, we've got to continue to work hard and, and work well together. The last question I have today is uh, sick days and substitute teachers, if uh, that happens. There's a shortage. Uh, this, um, my team will tell you that back in the spring, before we even knew the word, well, we knew the word hybrid, but before we used it every other sentence, um, I said that this is going to become the greatest workforce issue that education has faced, certainly in my time. You know, I don't know about other times. I can't speak for generations before I was born. Um, but the shortages that we are going to face and all the services that we need are, are going to be extreme. So that does not mean that I would ever put you in a situation that if you are sick or if you have symptoms of COVID-19, uh, that you are forced to come to work. That is not what I want you to hear. What I want you to hear, the reality, is that we have to be flexible, nimble, and that dial that I mentioned because of some of the things that we could face in the future. I'd love to see it all going the right way, get us on a nice cadence of moving back to in-person instruction. But we have to know there could be some setbacks too. And workforce for St. Paul Public Schools, there's 6,000 of you, is, a, is the most important part of what we do. So we have to keep that in mind and, and be realistic about that. So of course, we'll work with all of our partners. I know bus drivers has come up, that's become a national conversation. Substitute teachers, which even on the best day, is a challenge. But if it's a Friday and it's 90 degrees out and, and beautiful, sometimes it's even a, a bigger challenge as, um, as we face uh, shortages. So we've got to make sure that we're uh, planning together, being thoughtful, thinking ahead, and contingency planning going from being um, the three models that I've recognized and now being individual circumstances within those models that we can be ready for. So I'm going to close for today. I, I, I would really like to continue doing these sessions with you. I'm going to work with our team to find some ways to do some live interactivity. I would like to also bring in some of my team so you can hear from them as well in some of these sessions. Uh, it's been helpful for me to share this with you and to have us get this recorded so it can be out there as a